We are tracking unrest and protests across the country following a controversial grand jury decision in the Breonna Taylor case. During protests in Louisville, Kentucky last night, two police officers were shot. The suspect is now in custody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Brenda Braxton. It has been a tumultuous 24 hours and NBC's Blaine Alexander has a wrap up. Two Louisville police officers are recovering, shot during unrest overnight that gripped much of the city's downtown. This gunfire captured in a police live stream in the area where the officer's shooting took place. Officer down, right there. Officer down. I am very concerned about the safety of our officers. Obviously, we've had two officers shot tonight, and that is very serious. It's a very dangerous condition. Anger spilling into the streets after the grand jury decision in the Breonna Taylor case. Louisville under a 9 p.m. curfew, the National Guard moving in as police and protesters clashed. Similar emotions echoing in cities nationwide, from Chicago to Atlanta to New York City, even turning violent in Denver and Buffalo, where cars plowed into protesters, and in Portland, where a Molotov cocktail thrown at police caused chaos. Taylor, a 26-year-old former EMT, was shot to death back in March when police, with a no-knock warrant, entered her apartment. She was inside with her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker. He says police never announced themselves. According to the state's attorney general, officers and a civilian witness say they did. Walker thought they were intruders and fired a shot. Police responded with gunfire, killing Taylor. Of the three officers involved, only one will face charges, but not for Taylor's death. Former officer Brett Hankison charged with wanton endangerment for firing bullets into Taylor's apartment that ended up in a neighboring apartment. For the other two officers, no charges. According to Kentucky law, the use of force by Mattingly and Cosgrove was justified to protect themselves. There will be celebrities, influencers, and activists who having never lived in Kentucky will try to tell us how to feel, suggesting they understand the facts of this case, but they don't. For many filling the streets. Was it surprising for you? No, it's not surprising. Very rarely do black people get justice when it comes to police. In a scathing statement, attorney Ben Crump, who represents Taylor's family, writes, how ironic and typical that the only charges brought in this case were for shots fired into the apartment of a white neighbor. We know that across Louisville, more than 100 people were arrested. Curfew is set to go into effect again tonight at 9 p.m. In Louisville, Kentucky, I'm Blaine Alexander, NBC News. Here in Portland, police declared a riot downtown as hundreds gathered in front of the Justice Center. Officers and federal agents used flashbangs and pepper balls to clear the area. The crowd responded, throwing three Molotov cocktails along with rocks, bottles and cans. We also saw part of the building's awning set on fire. Three officers were injured and police made multiple arrests before breaking up the crowd around 1 a.m. Now, the protests started peacefully earlier in the night with people coming out despite the rain. They chanted Breonna Taylor's name. Several speakers talked about the discrimination they faced in their own lives and expressed outrage over the lack of charges against the officers in Louisville. Well, Portland police are preparing for the potential of more violence this weekend, this time between Antifa and the Proud Boys, a far right group. The Proud Boys announced a gathering at Delta Park on Saturday, but the Parks Department, under the leadership of Commissioner Amanda Fritz, denied the permit, saying COVID restrictions don't allow groups of 50 or more. The Proud Boys are expecting thousands, and Fritz said social distancing isn't possible in a crowd that size. We double-checked with the Parks Department, and it did not approve any permits this summer for any group to protest, but obviously the protests have gone on anyway. Anti-fascist groups are also planning events near Delta Park on the same day, Saturday. Portland police say they're monitoring the situation since rallies like these have been violent in the past. We do expect to get a few more specifics about what police plan to do when Chief Chuck Lavelle holds a press conference this afternoon at 1.30. We will stream it live on KGW.com and on our social media pages. Now to the wildfires in Oregon. And this morning, we toured the Emergency Coordination Center in Salem. 
That's where officials are working on the statewide response to this emergency. They're coordinating resources and connecting local emergency workers with federal help. Oregon had more than 47 states provide some level of assistance in person or virtually during this crisis. Well, the rain is a welcome sight for firefighters. Right now, there are 10 wildfires burning in Oregon, but earlier this month, that number was almost 40. So progress. Governor Kate Brown described the fight as, quote, entering a new phase. The rain this week does provide some relief, but it also increases the chance of falling trees. Uh, we certainly would expect, uh, just like we saw in Eagle Creek with Interstate 84, the challenges uh, of fires burning on those deep hillsides adjacent to road. The wildfires could cost the state of Oregon more than $100 million, but it's hoping FEMA covers half of that. In the meantime, there's a new challenge. People going into the fire zone to get a look at the damage. A paraglider and a drone entered restricted airspace recently, grounding the actual firefighting helicopters. Officials are asking the public to stop. Let's take a live look outside from our Wells Fargo sky cam. I see a little bit of blue there in the distance, but the theme is rain. Rod, I know you have your eye on the radar today. I do, uh, although, and you just showed the, the sky camera there, uh, it's actually been a pretty quiet, pretty nice day. Here's a look at uh, Doppler radar, the rain continuing to be primarily here on the west side. And as I take you in closer, still some lightning strikes up north of our region, across parts of uh, western Washington, but nothing in our immediate zone. Uh, here's the radar, pretty good passing shower right now in Salem. Overall, most of the showers have still been coast range and cascades and then kind of fading as they move in. Now, as we go through the heat of the afternoon, we might start to see increasing shower activity across the flats of the valley. A couple more live cameras for you. The coast has had a nice mix of sunshine, just like the valley has so far today. That's Cannon Beach Live 62 and downtown Portland 68. It's already warmer than I thought we would be this afternoon. I've upped our temperature with a mix of sun breaks and scattered showers continuing to 70. I would tell you, if we just continue to warm up, the air mass in place could support a high this afternoon of 74. Steady rain. One more real good rain soaker comes in tomorrow. We'll take a look at the latest future cast to track that shortly. See you then. Thank you, Rod. Now to the coronavirus. Oregon is seeing another ip uptick rather in cases after Labor Day weekend. Yesterday, the state health authority reported 193 new infections and six deaths. Since these wildfires started, testing has dropped significantly because smoke closed a lot of the testing sites. And the people who are getting tested are seeing a higher rate of positive results. COVID cases also rising sharply in Clark County. And that is delaying the start of in-person school for some of the kids there. This week, the Evergreen District started bringing some kindergartners back in small groups. That will continue, but Evergreen is delaying its plan to expand hybrid learning to all elementary schools by mid-October. Washington health officials blame the spike on Labor Day gatherings and people congregating indoors because of the wildfire smoke. It's stressful. I mean, um, everyone's a little bit bummed because they can't go to classes. But I think it's being able to move into the dorms, I think it's, it helps the experience. It is move-in day for students at Portland State University. During the pandemic, though, all dorms have only one person per room. Today, we saw kids moving into the Broadway Residence Hall on Southwest Jackson Street. Only about 800 kids will live on campus this fall, even though there's room for 2,000. Classes are getting underway at a lot of universities. Students at Oregon State, for instance, went back yesterday. There are also a lot of kids who are studying out of state right now. In fact, some of them have been at it since last month. Harley Hicks is studying at Davenport University in Michigan. She says distance learning in a new city without a lot of support hasn't been easy. It's definitely hard because you kind of rely on those relationships and those friendships as you're far away from home. And you can't really do that if you're in isolation. All but one of Harley's classes are being taught remotely.